The team has four objectives for today's webinar. One, understand the need to define local mastery. Two, align mastery with local assessment plans. Three, determine stakeholder involvement with mastery. And four, evaluate how data will be used from year to year. On today's agenda, we will help define student mastery, district implementation, student mastery data views, leadership and student mastery, and end of year data. And now let's go to Jeremy. Thank you, Armando. Um, to kind of get us kicked off, we have an opening question to kind of get us warmed up. So this is a active participation piece. The question is, it's almost October. What song best describes you right now? Is it Dance the Night from Dua Lipa? Is it Only Human from uh, uh, the Jonas Brothers? Is it Calm Down from Brema? Or is it Cruel Summer by Taylor Swift? Pick an answer and type it into the chat and let us know where are you now that October is almost here. Oh, here we go. Got some answers coming in. We've got some bees, only human, a couple calm downs, the seas. Some a uh, couple of cruel summers. That's good. So we've got a variety of responses coming in. Very cool. I hope those of you that are saying Cruel Summer, I hope uh, October is giving you some relief. All right, let's continue. Let's talk about mastery. We're going to first address the elephant in the room and discuss in greater detail what we believe student mastery is, and therefore how our new student mastery tracker tool can be used. Mastery is a buzzword. And so what we really have to do is separate the buzzword from the story and actually tell our story about mastery. We started when we, we were really trying to start creating the Mastery Tracker tool. We actually started with our own internal definition of mastery, which led us to this idea that it isn't really a performance level thing. And it's definitely not a star or just a star thing, but rather it's something that is determined on a daily ongoing basis. It's allowing teachers to capture what they see happening in the classroom and on assessments and kind of joining that data together. Any teacher is capable of pointing out students that understand. So you can walk into the room and say, who in your room right now knows what's going on? And your teachers can spout off right, right away who they, who's got it and who doesn't. However, we can be a little more surgical with how we look at and understand student mastery, especially with this new student mastery tool. So how do we begin to determine these things in your district? And what impact does mastery have on your everyday practices? At Edgeforia, we actually started our journey with this through research, as I'm sure you would want to start it through research as well. The, and with the research, we referenced actual like research articles, best practices, but then also referenced several people out in our user base. Some of you might actually be in this uh, room, room now. <clears throat> Some of you might actually be in this room right now watching this webinar today. So we highly recommend that you go through a similar journey with your staff when you're trying to decide what is it that mastery is and how are we going to use this tool to the best of our advantage to make sure that everyone is on the same page. At the bottom of this slideshow, which like Armando said, you'll receive um, within a day or so after this uh, webinar concludes, there are two articles that really discuss defining and using mastery. And then there are questions that we've provided that you can probably use to help just guide the conversations you can ask your staff. If you apply to mastery based approach in your classroom or in your practice, what did or does that actually look like? What success and or challenges do or did you experience? How do you anticipate engaging with mastery in your day to day work? And what unanswered questions do you have about mastery? What is what continued team conversations can you see or are needed as you go through this journey? The most powerful concept that we took away from these articles that are linked down at the bottom is that the teacher confers mastery daily and how the students perceive mastery and their desire to achieve it is a massive impact. So we have to talk a little bit more about that. So what evidence supports the interpretation of mastery? It's district decisions and conversations that have to be undertaken in order to answer that question. We have to ask ourselves, how do grades play a part or do they play a part? Is that actually part of the evidence that aligns to support the determination of the standards of mastery? Um, we have to talk about Bloom's taxonomy. 
and that how that applies to the depth of the instruction in the classroom. We have to talk about depth of knowledge and the interplay with Bloom's and the interplay with the standards and see how are Bloom's and the depth of knowledge impacting our assessment of learning and therefore mastery. Are there some examples of evidence that you could include to actually determine mastery while you're having those conversations? Conversations. We also have to understand that mastery is not one measurement alone. And if it is a if it is a data point, that's not necessarily allow a teacher to determine that mastery when you're using strict one type uh, piece of evidence. So we have a list of evidence things to potentially include or look at including standard and rubric assessments, writing samples, in-class activities, student projects, formative assessments, and even the daily teacher observations. The most challenging question is, is based on what we read in those articles that we referenced, what is missing from these examples of evidence? And it, these are all great questions to ask yourself and others in your district. So what do we recommend when it comes to implementation? And we provide an area that supports this through district ownership and customization of the terminology that you utilize in your district. And we'll show you that a little later in the presentation. But when should your district actually implement the mastery tracker? Implementation should actually be strategic in that it should happen after all of your stakeholders, including your, your leadership and the teachers, are aligned in the definition of student mastery. District student mastery labels are defined and understood by all, and that's a must before you actually implement the tracker. Teachers need to understand which assessments are appropriate for determining mastery, and we'll show you how this works in a little bit, how to document some of the things that aren't necessarily in the system through like observation and day-to-day -day interaction with the kids. And stakeholders need to understand when teachers understand what kind of student groups we're actually targeting and are ideal for monitoring mastery. Is this something that we want to do with every single kid? Do we have the kind of resources and time to do that? Or do we want to target groups of students that we know are at the cusp of moving from one performance to a level, uh, to another level? Or do we want to target kids that show particular weaknesses and different standards? Those are kinds of things we have to discuss before you implement. As promised, this is an example picture of where the district can actually modify after all these conversations have happened to actually change the labels of what mastery looks like in your district. We provide you some defaults with limited, mastered, and exceeded, but what language would your district prefer? Allow staff members to be involved in that conversation to actually come up with the terms and descriptions that fit best for you. And then a district level person with the appropriate rights can go in and set those once those conversations have been it, like cemented. And then finally, adding descriptions, add clarification. So we provide you that opportunity to add descriptions so that as teachers move in and out of the district, you can align them a little easier and bypass a few of the conversations that might be needed. Not that you necessarily need to bypass them all. All right. So let's, before we transition over to Emily, ask one more quick question. Is your district currently implementing mastery in any way, whether it's through our trackers right now or through some other way, with data analysis practices using things like Quick Views and Aware? A, yes, we do. B, we're planning to begin implementing mastery in the next school year. C, no, we're not currently using mastery as part of data analysis. Or D, we need to talk about this more at our district level and go from there. Drop in your answer in the chat. I see some C's, D's. An A, good. I like the vulnerability and the honesty of the C's and the D's. The Master Tracker tool will help you shape those conversations and implement. Uh, there's a B right there, very cool. I like seeing that you're we're wanting to implement things. Excellent. Thank you all for engaging. All right, I'm going to pass things off to Emily now. Okay, so we're going to transition a little bit, keeping that same idea of district implementation and really kind of get into the weeds and give you some actual narrative that you can take back to your district and have these conversations, along with the data components that the mastery tracker contains. And so as we kick this section off, we really like to start with our philosophy at Edgeforia, because again, we came to a table and we all said, how do we really feel about this? And one of the major conclusions that we came to when building this tool is that teacher perception is so critically important. And so we know that there is software out there that will regurgitate a mastery or not mastering terms for you related to students, 
but how much does that computer or software know about those students? How much is it living with them every single day? And the answer is it's not. And so the teacher is really the most qualified person to make that interpretation. They are seeing what is happening in the classroom. They are also seeing the standard assessment results, but more importantly, they're seeing that learning that's occurring every day. So that teacher is the most qualified person to really give us that perception of where the student really is and provide evidence that supports that. In addition, another belief that we strongly have at Edgefori is all students can learn. And so being in a limited status of mastery is not a life sentence. Students may spend more time in learning and that is perfectly fine. We all know that they are capable of it, but learning looks different. I often say it looks very messy until you come to that place of mastery. What we absolutely love about the tools, we're trying to showcase different lenses so you can see overall student performance and you get previews into how students learning is looking and a little preview into that messy interface. And so you can see what's happening with that student learning. So let's start with talking about what does the mastery tracker include? So you can kind of think through the elements that you have here. And this tool is very broad. It is not just one data tool. It contains lots of different elements. So we like to talk you through these comprehensively so you can really think through what you're getting. The first piece that wins with teachers is this is a data analysis tracking tool. So I ask teachers when I go out and visit districts, are you tired of hand tallying standards and every hand goes up in the room. Are you tired of pulling it all into Excel and trying to manipulate documents? Yes, every teacher is. So this mastery tracker will get rid of those for you. It will automatically track student learning by standard performance over time, over every administration that you choose to pull into the tracker. That is the winning story here, honestly. So if you hear anything, you hear that it will track student learning by standard over time for every assessment. It also will include and showcase a lens into that raw score and um, as well as the most recent score. So that's beautiful. What is the long-term raw score for this student? How well did they do on the most recent assessment they were given? Um, in addition, all of our newest tools are bringing you depth of knowledge for that lens in order to really interpret mastery. In all honesty, you cannot interpret mastery unless you understand the depth of knowledge level that you are asking these questions. If it does not match the standard, then we're not at a place where we can really identify mastery. We can interpret if a student's moving there, but we cannot identify mastery at that point. Um, as far as year-to-year -year data, this is extremely valuable. So the tracker is gonna be unique and that after a teacher has students that move on to the next grade, they will still maintain a summary view of their tracker, extremely valuable. So they will lose the kids as they fall off, but they will overall see a teacher report card of how they interpreted and did their standards throughout the school year in order to compare a previous year to an upcoming school year. And so another piece of valuable data that we try to maintain, but this will actually provide it for you pretty clear Early. And then lastly, we have that teacher perception, which we keep leaning into how important that is. They are able to determine students that are mastering, who are limited, and all of those things based on your terms within your school district. But really importantly, they're able to add comments to support their interpretation. And so maybe this student hasn't done as well on assessments, but here's what I've seen in class. Here's how much test anxiety that student has. That is valuable insight that we're allowing teachers to put in comment boxes and it contains that information with longevity so that you can see that historically. Okay, so as we start having these conversations and as you start taking this away, what should you really ask yourself at your district? 
And the first thing is always what assessments should we bring into the tracker? So after you've defined those terms and you've come to those agreements, then you start saying what assessments in our district determine mastery? Maybe we have teacher informal assessments. Do those contribute to mastery? Maybe we have true summative assessments that we give at the end of a unit. Do those determine mastery? What is everything in between that we want to utilize? One of the great pieces of the tracker is you get to pick a test type. You don't have to pick every single individual assessment. You get to pick a test type and say all of these benchmarks, all of these unit assessments contribute to mastery. And so that's extremely valuable. We, however, give you the opportunity to say, ooh, we did say unit assessments, but not unit six. <laughs> Maybe unit six was one of those that overall you want to remove that from the mastery analysis because it throws the data off. We also give you the opportunity to do that. But a great conversation is, does this assessment contribute to how we would interpret mastery in our district? And then the second question is, what group of students do we want to begin monitoring? So a lot of people right off the bat, I've been having this question at a lot of districts and they're like, everybody, and I'm like, well, do you want to start with everybody? And I've had extremely valuable conversations because I talked to a couple of teachers who said, you know what? I want to start with my advanced students. I want to start with GT students. I want to start with kids who have traditionally mastered assessments in the past because they should be able to demonstrate mastery. That's great. I've also worked with teachers who have said, I want to start with students who didn't, who were low performing in the past or have been continuously low performing. And they're in a monitor group that I've created. So I want to start with them. That is excellent. You can start with any of those group of students. You can. You can grab every single student you have and begin to make a tracker. Just again, know that you're not limited. You can make several trackers as a teacher. So maybe you do want a high performing tracker. Maybe you do want a low performing. Um, maybe you want anything in between, but you're not limited to maintaining everything within one tracker. You can really balance it out and do it multiple different ways. So great places to start. And again, if you're worried about it's one more thing on teacher's plate, start with a smaller group and just start tracking the readiness standards. We allow you to do so within the tracker. So you'll be able to make all of those holistic decisions ahead of time so that your implementation can be very small and that's great. Or you can really take full ownership of the tracker and fully implement. Okay, if depth of knowledge is a piece in your district that you're like, well, we've talked about it or we've heard about it, but it's something that we haven't begun to take ownership of, then we highly recommend that you start these conversations. Starting anywhere with these conversations is very positive. Every depth of knowledge conversation I've had in a lot of districts, even lately, has gone extremely well. So as a resource, if you need support for yourself, we worked with Eric Francis from Solution Tree and did a webinar series about a year ago. And the webinar is extremely well done. Um, he is very knowledgeable in, in depth of knowledge as a whole. And so I've already watched it twice. Um, so it's one of those you can go back and keep watching and learn something new. So that may be a place for you to start and to start navigating these conversations related to depth of knowledge. All right, and as a last little piece here, why is depth of knowledge very important? And this example really showcases it. And so the standard is written on the left. It is 4.8B. And I kind of gave you the answer here, but what is the standard actually asking the student to do? Well, it is asking the student to describe and explain. And in this case, they are describing and they are explaining the actual water cycle. And so, we can turn and then look to the right and see this is the actual question that was asked on an assessment. And within this question, the student is simply identifying energy sources of the water cycle by clicking on them. And so if we look back again at that standard, they're really describing and explaining at a higher level. And so does that match up with the way that we ask the question? And the answer is no. The standard is written at a higher depth of knowledge 
than the actual question. Is it wrong to utilize this question? Absolutely not. This is a foundational basic recall question to start understanding if the students can recall these facts to you. But again, if we just had given this question, this would not be enough for us to determine mastery of 4.8b. All right, so let's pause and hear from you. That was a lot of inform information about implementation. And so let's pause and see, how do you feel about depth of knowledge? So is your district using depth of knowledge on assessments? Do you plan to in the future? So you can give us an A. Yes, we do. We are getting there. We are planning in the future. Um, we are planning to begin maybe next year. Maybe you're kind of starting having leadership conversations. Um, C, no, we do not currently. And we don't have plans to, but hopefully maybe we'll change your mind. Um, but we or maybe we just need to talk about this within our district. And so let us know kind of where you are. No harm, no foul, but just knowing that a lot, um, actually all of our tools that we're really pushing out right now for data analysis contain depth of knowledge for that high quality lens to view your assessments and interpret your data. Very, very, very valuable. These are my favorite conversations to have with teachers too. So I've seen, we've had a variety. We've had all the way from A, B, C to D. And so hopefully that got you thinking about where you are as a district. Um, yay, shout outs to the A's and the B's that are moving in that direction and to the C's and the D's, that's okay. Let's take some time and think about where we need to go because if not, we're really missing an opportunity in how we analyze our data. Very cool, all right. Now, let's actually talk about the mastery tracker itself. In the slideshow, um, you're going to receive a couple of slides here that we're not going to spend any time presenting to you right now. But when you get the copy of the slideshow, you may want to keep these slides for maybe internal training or something that you have coming along. So I'll pre though, preview those with you just very quickly, and then we're going to transition into a live demonstration of a mastery tracker. Within the Master Tracker, once you have them set up, there are several different views. And the first is the student summary view. The second will be the individual standard view. The third will be the individual student view. The fourth will be the assessment view. And the final, and my personal favorite, and I'll explain why here in just a little bit, the actual Mastery Summary Overview. So let's transition over into in a mastery tracker that's already been created for demonstration purposes. This is a mastery tracker that has been created for fifth grade math. Right now, it only has three assessments that are tied into it. So one of the benefits of using mastery tracking, uh, mastery trackers is I can get started making it partway through the year, say after the first two assessments have been given, and then I can load those two assessments in and then I can go gauge mastery. And then as I do more assessments, I can add them to the tracker and then keep going. So while only three are in at the moment, I have a lot of potential to get every single assessment throughout the year in and continue to monitor mastery as the year progresses. So within the student summary view, this is so to speak, the Mastery Tracker landing page. I've uh, got a table of Mastery Trackers. I select the one I want, and this is where I'm going to land. You'll notice there's students on the left-hand side, and there are standards all along the top. And I can see almost, I almost hesitate to use these words, but it's almost like a grade book view where I have students and assignments, and I can start putting in here what level of mastery best describes the data that I'm seeing that's been connected to the tracker. Now, Emily pointed out a little earlier that within the trackers, you have two big points of data when looking at most of the data in a tracker. You have the latest raw score and you have the total raw score. Like I said, we've given three assessments up to this point with this particular tracker. And I can see with Mr. Bailey, he has two out of six for a total raw score across all three assessments, but only one out of two for the most recent assessment that included this standard. We've also built it, though, to adjust for like student absences or things like that. So if there was a student that was absent, they don't get penalized. So just keep that in mind. The latest raw is always going to be the one that the student actually took most recently. So when you look at this, I can compare the latest raw with the total raw. This leads itself right into that story Emily described earlier on in the webinar about why do we not just automatically calculate mastery in some form or fashion. If I come down a little ways, 
Here's a really good example with Stephen Cameron. They have four out of six total raw score, but the most recent assessment is two out of two. But because they got two out of two, maybe they actually have mastered it. And the first time that they did this, uh, this particular standard and assessed on this standard, they weren't at the mastery level. So maybe they were limited to begin with. And then when I did the most recent assessment, then I got the chance to bump them up to the mastered. If I come even further down, Olivia Johnson, similar story, but she's at the exceeded. She has five out of six, but the most recent assessment continued to demonstrate that she had that level of mastery, and then I was able to hit exceeded. In most of the views we show you, you have the ability to change or apply a mastery rating. All of the mastery ratings are going to be uh, the same across each of the different views. So if I were to set it here and then move to the student view, whatever I set here will be the same in the student view. Then if I change it in the student view and come back to here, whatever I change it in the student view, it'll be the same here as well. So you have essentially not necessarily one source of truth, but you have one source of mastery, if that makes sense, depending on which data view you're using to gauge that mastery level. With this, like we said, there's a, a lot of potential for teachers to have observations in the classroom, formative interactions with the students. And while this student had a two out of two most recently, there's a teacher comment here that says that while the last assessment shows two out of two, the practice check that we did the next morning showed no retention. So that's why I kept them at limited. It allows the teacher to provide a lot of context and wealth to what is in here other than just some raw numbers. And it allows them to pull in some information that may not be tied to an assessment. You'll notice the color coding next to the standards as well. One of the big cool uh, pieces of this that's in common across most of these is I can actually filter by type of standard. Emily mentioned earlier, if all I'm really worried about is readiness standards, I can filter down and just look at the readiness standards. And of course, at this point, I have not rated in our uh, practice most of the readiness standards, and we'll show what this looks like in a later step on the implications here. But I have actually rated this particular student all the way across. If I want to look similarly at supporting skills only, I apply the filter, the view changes, and I see just the supporting skills or any skill combination that I want. And then the last thing I want to point out in the student summary, which is in common again across most of our views, is this toggle to transition between an actual number score and a percent score. Some people are much more comfortable with percent scores than just raw scores. And so if I want this two out of six to be a percent, I can toggle this and I get the 33.3%. And I can see kind of how those numbers are playing out um, on a percentage. And any user can change that at their leisure, depending on what they're most comfortable with. Now let's dive into the individual standard view. To get to the individual standard view, click the standard you're most interested in viewing. I'll just start with 5.1a. When I click 5.1a, it takes me to the individual standard view and the view changes. I still have students down the left, but now I have assessments across the top that included that standard. Of course, you guys know not every assessment includes every single standard. And so each individual standard view will be unique to that standard. Now, here's where the depth of knowledge really comes into play with mastery. When I am trying to determine whether or not a student mastered, if I see mostly DOK1s in any given column, I have to compare my understanding of that standard to the rigor of the assessments. And if I'm seeing only DOK1 questions in the test, but the standard is at least a DOK2, that's going to influence what I'm going to set for my mastery on the right and what comments I might drop. We've built in the ability for you to filter by DOK. So if I only want to see DOK2s, uh, or sorry, click it and it removes DOK2s, I can remove DOK3, remove DOK1, and just see DOK2. Or, and I think several districts are going to be in this boat, maybe I don't have DOKs tied to my questions yet. And if I don't have DOKs tied to my questions, I can just get rid of all of these and see the no DOKs and clean up the view just a little bit. And so it can kind of take it from potentially an overwhelming down to let's really focus in on what I'm wanting to look at here and simplify the view as we're making perceptions. And then another neat piece, I can combine my DOKs into one bubble. So if I'm wanting to just make a holistic view, I can toggle that, look at all of the DOKs um, for each of the tests straight down the board, and then I can see my total raw score off to the right while I'm setting those perceptions. Notice there is no latest total raw score at this view like there was in the previous. 
that's missing really because it's kind of already here. I gave these two assessments at particular times in the year, and the most recent one is probably this one that's furthest to the right. And so the latest raw is kind of built in, so to speak, when you look at the most recent assessment. Now let's go to the individual student view. I can get to the individual student view in a couple of different ways. We try to make it so that you can kind of swim in the data, so to speak, from view to view without a whole lot of roadblocks. So I can do it from the standard view just by clicking straight on the student's name, or I can do it from the student summary landing page by clicking on the student's name. So let's pretend I was still in the standard view. And let's say I wanted to look at Gabrielle Brown. When I click that individual student view, notice it changes a little. I no longer have students' names down the side on the left. I now have standards down the side on the left, and I'm retaining assessments across the top. Now that I've clicked on the individual student view, I can see every assessment that's uh, that has been connected to this tracker, and I can also see every standard that has been assessed and the raw score across all of them. With this particular student, I went ahead and did all of the teacher perceptions all the way down, but if I were to choose a different student, say Eric Bailey, Notice I have not finished the perceptions for this student all the way down, even though data is all available in here. We're going to see in another view how you can actually see this at a summary level and really target potential assessments or potential standards that really need you to dive in and make some mastery assessments um, as you go into it. Notice within the uh, individual student view, there's also DOK, just like there was in the standard view. So I can use these filters to narrow it down or combine or I can even filter um, by standard types to hide some of these standards on the left and really narrow in on what I'm most worried about. And then as always, we have the toggle for percentage versus raw scores, which affect the chips in the middle, but also the raw score on the uh, total raw score column. Now let's dive into the assessment view. The assessment view is the only view that really requires you to choose something before you can get to the assessment view. The assessment view can be accessed from the individual student view or the individual standard view. And so let's say I wanted to look at this cumulative math test in isolation. This looks really similar to the student summary, but now it's been refined and filtered down to only the standards that are on this one test. I see all of my kids, I see this one test, I see only the standards that are tied to this test. This particular test had a lot of standards, but I'm also seeing a total raw and a test raw. We have a vocabulary shift here just a little bit. We felt it was really, really valuable to continue to show you the total raw because this particular test tested this standard four raw score, four times, potentially four questions. And it tested this standard potentially three different times. But I still have the context of every single time it's been assessed so that if I uncover anything while I'm in this particular data view, I can make a change to the mastery level, select it, move it, and it will add or change that mastery level to any of the other views from here. Functionality wise, this is an extremely similar view to the student summary. It's just a little more filtered down. Last but not least, we have the mastery overview. The mastery overview can only be accessed in one way, and that's from the landing page, and you toggle up at the top left it, from student summary to the mastery overview. This one is my favorite view because it's what Emily referenced to before as the mastery report card, so to speak. This is the view that will be saved and will follow the teacher across multiple years. As we look at each of these data points, the raw data actually changes just a little bit. When I see the data in these next to each standard, I see DOK1 had a max raw score of three, and then it's telling me the approximate average score of the students across all assessments for that standard. So all of my students got approximately 1.3 raw score points out of three. Then at DOK2, I got 0 0.36 out of one. This might clue me into the fact that, hey, my DOK standard, like DOK2 or DOK3, these are really causing my students some problems. And maybe we need to look either at the question structure or the rigor of the instruction. It just leads you to questions that you can start investigating into. You still have a bunch of the filters. I can filter by various DOKs. I can show just uh, the combinations that I want. I can combine them if I like. But then on the right-hand side, you get some really powerful information. 
we have a key up here for different color dots that show you your levels of mastery that you've tied to the tracker settings. And for 5.1a in this particular case, I can see the average is 3.13 out of 6 for the total number of times it's been asked across each of the tests. And I can see the spread of mastery across all of those assessments that tested that particular standard. So about 24% of my kids, I decided where I'd exceeded, about a third at mastered, and then 43% at limited. But then notice the gray is not set. As I come down, I can see at a glance, oh, this particular standard hasn't been set for 90% of my kids. So I see that 90%, no, I need to go and set that. I can go ahead and click my standard, and then I go straight into that standard view, and I can start setting mastery for that particular one all the way down. It's kind of a one-stop shop on where do I need to pay attention in the mastery overview, and then it helps direct me to that place where I can spend some of that attention. So as I come down, you can see 95% hasn't been set on each of these. So it's kind of a good clue on where I need to go maybe pay a little bit of attention, but also gives me the 60,000 foot view of about where is mastery for my students across the board. Um, and that is our preview. Now that you've gotten a chance to see the mastery trackers kind of in action with a live demo, we want to ask you now, which mastery view are you most excited to explore? Is it that very first one I showed you, the student summary view? Is it the second one, the individual student standard view, the individual student view, the assessment view, or the mastery summary overview? Drop your answer in. Oh, I see a couple of E's already. I see several E's. I like it. Birds of a feather. <laughs> so Kayla put all of them, A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> Very cool. A and E, good. I like the combos. Everyone's going to see different value in different areas, depending on your role, whether you're a teacher, a district administrator, et cetera, et cetera. Emily, back to you. All right. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. That was extremely helpful. Um, I'm glad y'all like the same views that we do. Y'all have the same thought process. So now we'll transition into leadership and mastery because you saw those shiny things. And if you are in a leadership position, you probably had a little light bulb that went off and you're like, how can I see this? <laughs> what does this look like? How can I help my teachers? So we want to prepare you with those things and give you some insight. Okay, so let's start out with who in the world can view teacher trackers. And so I've given you the picture over here on the upper right. So if you have the right that says you can analyze tests at your campus or at multiple campuses, then you can see teachers trackers, okay? And so making sure that you have that capability that allowed you to view those trackers, okay? Again, you only have view only access. So you won't be able to go in there and manipulate it with them. Um, you will just be able to view it and to be able to see it for those valuable conversations. But again, you're not restricted. You do have the mastery section and you can go look at it and filter by subject grade level and the teacher's name. So that's also valuable. So if a teacher calls their tracker, like go get them, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. You'll be able to search by that actual teacher by their subject and you'll be able to find them. Okay, and so the next piece is if you are an administrator and you do have analyzed tests, then you do have two different tabs here. You have my trackers and then you have other trackers. Okay, so we want to be really clear because some people when you default in it lands on my trackers. Okay, and so if like this example in this screen screenshot right here shows that create trackers grayed out. Hopefully you can kind of see that button at the top. It's grayed out. And so within that case, it is grayed out because you don't have a rostered group of students associated with you as an administrator. In most cases, sometimes you do. So then that button wouldn't be grayed out. Um, so what you can do is you can, if you would love to go play with your own tracker, that would be me, you can grant yourself access to a student access list. So you can go through, we used to call these student monitor lists. You can go through, create that list of students, 
and add them to yourself. And then you could go build a tracker for them so that you get that experience playing with it. If I was an instructional coach, I would absolutely do that for some of the teachers that I was working with in order to say, this is what I thought mastery looked like in your classroom. What did you think? Um, and so you can do those pieces as well in working with each other. So we wanna make sure you know, you again can view teachers trackers if you have analyzed tests at the campus level. And then again, you can create your own tracker if you decide to create a student access list and give yourself some ownership of some students. Okay, so let's talk about some best practice for viewing and really that support role that you're going to have. So you're really looking at the fact that you can view this. I, I, it was a Christmas present. I wish I would have had this as an instructional coach because you get to support teachers interpretation of mastery. That in and of itself is beautiful because we already talked about the need to define the terms. <laughs> so let's help you and support you through your interpretation of mastery. You can also help facilitate the assessment choices that teachers are making and say, let's take out this informal teacher test. I think it's giving us some invalid results in, in the realm of looking at mastery. You can also guide that student population that's being selected in the tracker. You saw Jeremy go through it and it is beautiful. It is a beautiful tool. But again, if you have 150 kids, that beautiful tool can be overwhelming. <laughs> so how can we make this something that teachers really take ownership of that's not overwhelming? And they can look at very quickly and say, I can do this. And this is very helpful for me. Um, how can we offer those coaching supports for standards that are not being mastered? That is honestly the story. <laughs> so what can we do to help you with those standards that students are continuously struggling with? And at certain times of the year, this is outstanding to have this lens and be able to know exactly what intervention and acceleration looks like within your classroom. Um, how can we also collaborate and get teachers working together based on their standards mastery? How can we partner them up and say, this teacher is doing extremely well on these standards and you're struggling with those standards in your classroom. Let's put you together. Let's ideate through this. And um, so it creates that instant collaboration that you can have and identify who your partners would be. And again, we've created this so it has longevity. So it's not just a year tool. You can see trends over time, over grade levels and over subjects. That in itself is pretty beautiful to be able to see where we have strong areas and weaker areas. And again, that could lean into your professional development plans from year to year as well. All right, so I said several things leaning into that administrative and supportive role. So I want to hear back from you, which practice um, do you think is going to be the most beneficial in your district? So to any one of those that I mentioned stick out to you. So helping to establish student groups with your teachers, supporting the understanding of the assessments that are needed, providing support to teachers in areas that they're struggling or using that depth of knowledge as a strategy with teachers that we mentioned a little earlier. Or of course you can give us several, several of those sound appealing. Uh, yeah, I know. See, I totally agree. Providing support to teachers. Um, that is the number one goal here. And so it's not just to have another data piece, but how can we help you in these particular areas? Um, so absolutely. And then seeing those trends over time, maybe all brand new teachers are struggling with these standards. What can we do to help them? And um, that is a great conclusion to draw from these data sets that we would consider extremely valuable. All right, so as we kind of wrap up today, we're gonna to talk about the end of the year data and what happens to the tracker at the end of the year. So you can start thinking about these things and build them and establish them into your processes. All right, so as we mentioned, this tool does have longevity to it, so exciting. So this tool will automatically archive itself. And so at the end of the school year, it is gonna recognize your calendar within the system. And teachers, when they lose access to students, they will maintain that summary view of their data to be able to cross correlate from year to year and be able to utilize. So that will not be an extra step for you at the end of the year process. I'm gonna pause for a celebration for you there. Yay, that's not one more thing you have to do. 
that will naturally happen um, from year to year, that archiving process of the mastery tracker. But again, the teacher will hold on to that summary view, but lose those rostered students that they had the previous year. Okay, another great gift is that this is going to be automatically associated with the student profile, meaning that the students get their own mastery standards mastery report card. Yay. So once they go into the next grade level, that fifth grade teacher can be like, oh, I'm going to go look and see how they did on their standards in fourth grade and cross compare and see what I'm really getting. So this really helps with those transitions that are happening throughout the year where you're running around trying to hand off folders and information. This will naturally tie itself to the student record. So you'll be able to see this historically every year that a mastery tracker is done on that particular student. So extremely valuable to see exactly how they did on each of those standards and if their previous teacher determined they had mastered those standards the last school year. All right, so what will data look like within the tracker? And so um, we like to give you some of these to think about too, because again, this isn't just a one piece data analysis tool. Like I have mentioned before, this is a brand new initiative. And so taking ownership of an initiative means you have to review it beginning, middle and end of year, and maybe sometimes in between. And so let's talk about at the beginning of the year. So once you've had a year of the tracker, what do you want teachers to look at and review from last year's tracker? What do you want them to look at for students who have a tracker associated with it? Um, what, what actions will staff be taking based on the data that you have in the system? And how will your instructional staff be utilizing these practices? I've kind of dropped in some ideas. If you've heard me, this could be very helpful for professional development. Maybe we identify trends with new teachers. Um, so making sure that those things are put into place at the beginning of the year as supports based on that data that you're collecting. In the middle of the year, this is honestly when the magic happens, in my opinion, it's when you're able to really go in and look at intervention. And so you're able to really say, what do our students need help with and what do they need acceleration? Where do they need to start moving faster and where are they doing extremely well? So how can teachers be supported based on that data that you're having at the middle of the year with those levels of intervention that are occurring? And how will those instructional staff, again, be utilizing that data to inform practices and support teachers? Um, at the end of the year, this is a really great thing to think about. How cool is this? Once you get those star results back, which hopefully this year we'll get them sooner, right? You'll be able to pull them into the tracker and then just line them up and start seeing, okay, here's where I thought the student was mastering. Did they master on star? And it's just, again, just that checks and balances to really see there could be lots of variables, but you can bring that in. And that star data at the end of the year will bring in by standards that you can actually compare and look at. Um, so what does that mean for, again, that professional development level? How does this really even affect your scope and sequence? So what does this look like for planning? What does this look, for, look like for your assessment calendar? There are lots of pieces at the end of the year to start really looking at and cross comparing how students did at the very end of the year based on how they were doing throughout the entire school year. Okay, and some final great questions to ask in your district. And we've really alluded to some of these, so we'll just kind of lightly touch on. Um, how can instructional coaches use this data? I feel like we've really sold that message throughout the entire presentation. What are principals going to do? How are they going to be involved with this data as well? Um, district administrators, for that matter, what is that role going to look like? How will this affect your PLCs? And then really importantly, what are guidelines and expectations for the use of the mastery tracker? And you know what's a great thing to say here is we have none. We have no guidelines and no expectations. If you're really starting to explore, that is perfectly reasonable. But as you start moving forward with clarity, as I think we've articulated, you might wanna start looking at, again, what assessments do we pull it in? What student groups? And how are we defining these terms? 
All right. So as we finalize our information today, what feature within the mastery tracker are you the most excited about overall? So are you really excited about tracking standards? And it's easy. Like I said, there's no hand telling and there's no spreadsheet view anymore. Yay. Um, are you excited about multiple different ways to analyze mastery? Because you saw Jeremy go through it very fluidly and you can see this in multiple different ways. That's pretty exciting. Are you excited about comparing the data to star at the end of the year? I kind of dropped that one on you. Um, are you also excited that the data stays with the teacher from year to year? That's a little present too. Or maybe you're E, you're my favorite people. You can't choose. All of the above are pretty darn exciting. And that's where you've landed today. So you've liked what you've learned about. Nope, you're all E's. That's awesome. You're all in the same boat. You love the different elements and hopefully you love the fact that you get to see it. You get that clear window into the tracker and we made sure we gave you the capability to create a tracker if you so desire. All right, so we will cover this and kind of reiterate these terms one last time just for you to think about. When should your district implement the mastery tracker? And the overall answer to that is now. You should now, it's available. Um, as long as your district has given some of those assessments, now is really starting to be a great time to implement the tracker and making sure that as long as you've defined those terms for mastery, you make sure that teachers understand what assessments and what student groups to start with and pulling that in. Then like I said, if you have, I've been telling teachers, if you have three or four assessments you've already given that you feel are valuable to interpret mastery, now is the time for you to start creating a tracker and start having these conversations. And I think that concludes my section. Oh, except for to say that this is an aware premium feature only. So if your district doesn't see the mastery tracker button active only in new navigation, then you can contact sales at edgeforia.net to learn more about aware premium. And I will hand it back over to Armando. Thank you, Emily and Jeremy. We are glad that this webinar has uh, been able to provide you with some points to consider as you begin to plan how your district will use the mastery tracker in the future. If you need additional assistance on this or for other topics, please email training at edgeforia.net. We want to remind you to visit our teacher learning site for Aware and Strive. We have created modules that consist of video and text learning resources and supports in addition to knowledge checks, discussion, and discussion prompts. The video content length ranges from a couple of minutes to about six minutes where the teacher can get topic-specific demonstrations on utilizing AWARE or STRIVE. Emily and Jeremy, thank you so much for hosting. On behalf of today's team and all of Eduphoria, we would like to thank you for joining us on today's webinar about student monitoring, tracking mastery of student learning. Have a great day.